morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here this morning, right on time. <laughs> everybody was all seated and ready to go. Paul is off today, so it'll be Eric and I, and uh, glad to see everybody. This is the weekend that we've gone from air conditioning and short sleeves to the furnace and, and long sleeves and sweaters and jackets. It's that time of year. Start out with some announcements. What have we got going on? Cam. Sorry about that, everybody. Well, we'll have everything up here on the screen for you this morning. Start out with our announcements. We have Bible study this week at 7 o'clock, and that's always available on Zoom also. Next Sunday, we have a carry-in lunch or potluck lunch, so if you can uh, join us for lunch after the service, that'd be great. If you have a busy week and you're not able to prepare anything, there's always lots of food, just come anyway. As it works out, um, we'll have some guests with us next Sunday for the service and for lunch. Uh, you see uh, Deidre Shilliday and uh, Frederick Manuku. They'll be here to tell us about their ministry in Kenya. It's called Harvest of Hope Africa. As it works out, we were having the lunch for Pastor Appreciation Day, so we're able to work that together and, and have lunch with our guests, and we'll be able to ask them more questions about their ministry after the service. So it should be an interesting uh, afternoon if we can visit with them. This time of year, the church board uh, looks at different um, outreaches that we might participate in so uh, this is one of those and if you'd like to know more about it be sure to be here and then October 29th is our church council meeting and it will be following the worship service so we'll conduct all our uh, business and elect officers for the coming year uh, right after the church service if you're able to stay for that Anything anyone wants to add to the announcements? Okay, then we'll go right along with our service. We'll start out with a prayer. So if we could pray, please. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together this morning again in fellowship with one another. You have carried us safely through another work, and we come to worship and give you thanks. This time of the year, we sense the changing of the seasons with the turning and the colors of the leaves, the beginning of fall harvest. We see all the miracles of your creation. We are so thankful and give you praise for all our blessings. David prayed in the Psalms that you, God, are our shepherd and we shall not want. We have been blessed with so much this summer and we are so blessed to live in this place, able to worship and follow you freely. We have what we need, and we live in peace. For all this, we give you thanks and praise. We pray for those that are living in stress and despair. May we help them find their way to you, Lord, so that they know there is forgiveness, that you bore our sins on the cross, and that there is peace and eternal life in you. We pray your spirit is with us today and guides our service. We thank Eric for bringing you our message. We ask you to bless him and his family. Here in this place, we can quiet our hearts and souls knowing you are with us. All this we pray in the name of your son. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading, and we have it on the screen and also in your bulletin. 
in the quiet, in the calm, in the stillness, in the clamor, in the cry, in the grief. In this time, in this place, with each other, even as we seek, let us worship God. You stand as you're able. We'll be singing hymn number 10 and 11. Now's our time for joys and concerns. If there's anything that anyone has to share this morning that we're Agnes.
this. Keep the country of Israel in prayer and those that are trapped in war innocently. Jean? Praying for Leonard as he faces some surgery coming up here. Rita? Uh, update on Chuck for Andy. Two, this Tuesday, he did some steps there. So hopefully it will be something for him. I got one more thank you. Okay. And you, you missed all four of them, eh? Good. <laughs> Glad you did. We just had a conversation before the service about the neighborhood, dear, <laughs> between Tom's place and my place. And we're always afraid that they'll get hit on the road, so we're glad you were able to avoid them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a joy to have electric. I don't know if you knew it, the electric was out, and had us a little concerned before the service. I'm glad we have it back. Okay, then let's have a little word of prayer for over these joys and concerns. Dear Lord, we pray for and lift up in prayer those with concerns this morning that have been mentioned. Pray for the country of Israel and anywhere in the world that there's war going on, <clears throat> pray that there will be peace soon. We pray for Leonard and the surgery that he will be facing and, and Chuck Bandy also. We pray that there will be successful, those surgeries, that the doctors and nurses <clears throat> will all be well equipped to do what's need to be done and they will feel so much better after these surgeries. Pray that you comfort them and give them strength in these times. <clears throat> we pray for Pastor Paul as he works towards his master's degree and the traveling back and forth that he's done this past week. We also remember their family. I believe they have uh, a memorial service for John Holzapple this week. We pray for them. We pray for this church and other churches in all these times of debate that seem to be going on. We have to remember Christ's answer to the question of what is the most important command. He replied to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So may we all come together under Christ's basic commands and agree to spread his word for his glory. We pray for all the innocents that are caught up in war that are going on around the world. Pray that you would protect them and that peace would come. But we know, Lord, there's no need to fear the future when we believe and trust that you have us in your hands. We pray your joy will fill our hearts and strengthen our souls today and through the coming week. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you could stand for the doxology, followed by hymn 621.
once again. Today, as you see in the bulletin, I'll be uh, reading in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 1 through 22. I had planned to uh, possibly, when Paul asked me to fill in today, uh, to a, a New Testament uh, uh, sermon, but I'll change course and say, well, Paul's been in the Old Testament, going through the book of Genesis, and I'll stick to the Old Testament as well. I'll skip my, I'm skipping ahead though, of course, uh, as he's uh, now in two weeks, we'll probably uh, continue on with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I'm, I'm speaking a little ahead of that after uh, uh, the story of Joseph as well in Genesis to uh, uh, Exodus, where you also find these same verses that we're studying today are in Exodus chapter 20. But first I'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the, this beautiful morning this morning with the sun's rays shining down on earth and giving us the warmth that uh, we desire with the colder temperatures. But uh, Lord, uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing each one out here this morning and those who might be listening online. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of them. And now we ask for your help by your, the Holy Spirit that uh, you would open our eyes and our ears and help us to, to understand your word and all that it means. In Christ's name, amen. So I chose today, or chose or, or felt led to uh, speak on the law. When we say the law, the, the Ten Commandments specifically. Um, now I know this is a uh, uh, a sermon that could be, well, as, as I was thinking of it, if I was a the senior pastor, I, I might uh, go ahead and do a, a minimum of ten weeks. <laughs> That's uh, two and a half months of Sundays to uh, go through each and every uh, command by themselves uh, to really get the fullness of each what uh, the meaning of each commandment and uh, as we know if you really dive into it uh, you read the rest of the uh, first five books of uh, the Bible that uh, uh, there's other laws that were specifically given to the nation of Israel that uh, are related to each and every one of these uh, but uh, but these Ten Commandments stand out, and I think uh, for a good reason. So I'll go ahead and, uh, if you follow along with me, read uh, verses 1 through 22 to begin with. I'm reading from the New King James Version translation. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make his, this covenant with our fathers, but with us. Those who are here today, all of us who are alive, the Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. Now, one one uh, side note here: I was going to ask before I even started reading that uh, before now looking through these commandments, how many of us would be able to, off the top of our head, uh, recite the Ten Commandments in order, in the correct order? <laughs> Just a, uh, I'm here seeing a bunch of shaking. <laughs> no, <laughs> but. Uh, Going on, he said, it is the Lord, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 
You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is in within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to all of your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Now you're thinking to yourself, how many of those did I know off the top of my head? Or how many did I... Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> that was one of the commandments. Um, but uh, I find that the, it is a it is a uh, detriment to uh, the church today that we were kind of the law is 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 not held or or studied as much as uh, as we uh, should. Um, uh, in the uh, as I'll speak on more of this towards the end of my sermon. That uh, it is a uh, a good thing, not only then but also today. Uh, uh, if you remember, uh, I remember I mean, how many years ago uh, in this country that uh, when there was a uh, uh, large uproar about uh, or those who were fighting that uh, even the display of the Ten Commandments in this country would be uh, considered unlawful in itself if some of us older generation remember that. But, beginning back into verse 1, Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers. Now who's... Who is he speaking of with the, the fathers? Uh, some of the uh, translations might say uh, ancients. Uh, I'm speaking more of the, the patriarchs, as which uh, the uh, uh, Pastor Paul will be speaking on when he continues with the sermon series uh, in Genesis of the fathers as being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, but he says, with, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive, the people who are that that God took out of Egypt and at that time brought them into the wilderness. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. Now, as Moses says, I, being Moses, stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. I, I can't help but uh, think of, uh, 
what, uh, what kind of uh, church service that was that day. Uh, uh, come to the service and hear the voice of the Lord commanding from a mountain and, and uh, full of smoke and, and, and fire and uh, to make you tremble. Um, I recently picked up a copy of uh, that old movie, Cecil Bill B. DeMille's uh, The Ten Commandments. I think most of us have probably at least watched it once. I always, always, always played their East, every Easter on, on the television. Uh, um, I enjoy it. Uh, um, but, uh, but they try to, even in that movie, you get uh, a, a, a sense of, uh, of what it would have been like to be there during this time. And yet, I still don't think it does it justice, as if we were there uh, in person. But it is a, uh, reminds me of the verse uh, as well in Scripture where, where he's, it states that the, our God is a consuming fire. Um, he is to be feared. Uh, this is no, say, mammy-pamby uh, uh, little don't worry about he's harmless God but moving on being uh, he said being God in, in the verse 5 I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage or some translations uh, slavery because they were slaves for hundreds of years that uh, I like how he, he does that he, he reminds them of this that in their slavery they did not suddenly get out of Egypt because well they went on the picket line or they went on strike and, and said we're not going to work any longer we're going to go out to the desert that's that <laughs> Uh, we're not going to, uh, even to the extent of revolt, pick up their own tools that they had and weapons and fight the Egyptians hand by hand, and uh, and revolt and, and and escape in that direct in that in that way. But yet, God has made the statement that uh, that them to not forget that He is the one that has brought them out of this bondage of this, this slavery and we come to the first commandment you shall have no other gods before me and of course we notice that in our Bibles that gods is lowercase g um, when speaking of the God of the universe the Bible should have uh, uh, an uppercase letter for God or, and you notice that uh, uh, even as this, throughout this chapter that the, my translation is New King James, and it translates uh, the personal name of God, Lord, all in capital letters. Um, uh, some other translations translate to the uh, Yahweh, um, the, the uh Lord speaks to Moses about when he asked him what his name is. But so this God's is lowercase g, before me or besides me. Uh, I went ahead and Googled it out of curiosity. Uh, how many religions are there in the world today? And I've come up with the answer, the uh, answer of uh, well over 4,000 uh, that was known today throughout the world. Uh, religions that uh, serve or s try to worship at least one God, and then there are several religions that worship uh, within that one religion many, many, many gods. Uh, they have gods for you name it, any objects throughout the earth or, or what are their imaginations. Um, but that the, these gods are, are not the true God. And even throughout the Old Testament, when we read, uh, 
God always warning Israel uh, about being with the other people land, around them in the, the promised land, about the mixing with their religions and serving false gods. But there is only one God and one true God, and that is the first and most important commandment, well, that's why it's number one, uh, that uh, no other gods before him. Because uh, once we, once we uh, go down that slippery slope, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a true uh, terrible thing that uh, the rest of our thinking, our, our, our uh, uh, pursuit in life um, can be construed, uh, twisted, um, not good, simply put. So, moving on to verse 8 to commandment number 2. You should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the skies, and that is, or that is in the earth beneath, and, or that it is in the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Iniquity, another word for uh, sin of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this subject of idols, are images, carved images. Now, here in America, we might say, well, we don't do that anymore. We don't go out, uh, pick a tree, as it's depicted in, I think, the book of Isaiah, chop it down, cut it up into pieces, and then just have whatever piece and mold it into whatever figure that I wanted to worship it as. Uh, we're a little too intellectual for that and smarter and uh, uh, educated that uh, we've come to know that uh, well, these trees are not alive and they can't serve us. They're not gods. Uh, yet, yet, I think there is still... A, uh, a danger in that we don't have to physically go out and carve an in image and bow down to it, but yet we have, here in America especially, blessed with many objects that while we not, might not go outside and go down and bow down for it between, before it and pray to it, uh, as you notice, I see there in verse 9, where he says, bow down to them, nor serve them. I think we can uh, definitely be aware of the uh, of uh, serving objects, material objects, that we are living our life to pursue, to attain, and to keep a hold of, that we change, alter our plans and such, and our affections, uh, is much, very much in danger of idolatry. I like how an old preacher that I like to uh, listen to, uh, he was definitely not soft, a uh, man by the name of Leonard Ravenhill, who, who stated that uh, anything that we love more than Jesus Christ is an idol. And that's true. Anything we put above our own Lord or God becomes an idol. It uh, takes our affection, takes our... our uh, our uh, worship and our uh, devotion, if it does, uh, we should be on guard that uh, this is becoming an idol in my life. Now, I know I would like to speak more, but like I said, this is just a, a Ten Commandments sermon that is kind of like the, the introductory, introductory sermon that I would preach. So... I would like to move more into the, the uh, speaking of the end of there, the third and fourth generations of those who hate me and the thousands of those who love me, but I'm going to refrain. <laughs> so that would be another, another time to, to speak on that. So I'll move on to the third commandment, found in verse 11. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God's name is holy, meaning separate, all by itself. It has, just like he says, no other gods before me, even his own name is extremely special. Um, that uh, we shouldn't take it lightly. Now this comes up with, uh, in my mind, if I'm going to speak on this commandment, it's just a, a short sp spurt. Uh, there's some uh, language in, that we have today that, uh, well, uh, most of, I hear this most often, the term, oh my, or the thing on your computer or, or other things, O-M-G. And uh, some flippantly say it, and I've heard somebody say, well, that's not, uh, that's not blasphemy. That would be as in taking God's name in vain. But yet uh, uh, I find that uh, you never hear anybody hit their finger with a hammer or uh, become in a, in, a, in a troubled situation and say, oh, my Buddha, or oh, my Hare Krishna, or... or so on and so forth. Oh my, Roger Rabbit. <laughs> you know, you name the name. It's, 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 not, it's not used as a, a curse or a, I want to tell you if I'm using the word term correctly, euphemism, or uh, that is just flippantly let out. Uh, I heard of uh, another evangelist say, would you, when asking people about this uh, commandment that, uh, would you ever use your mother's name in the same, same, same uh, routine? And they were like, most people, 100%, say, well, no, of course not. Well, why wouldn't you? Because I love her. She's my mother. And her name is special. And so same thing, way that uh, God, who is number one, uh, his name should be held in reverence and awe and the utmost respect. Moving on to verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger, or who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as, well as you. Uh, and remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. So the, in verse 15, there where he reiterates that the, you were, remember, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. But God, who has brought you out of here, uh, in this uh, previous lifestyle of cruel and bitter and hard bondage, uh, that uh, without any rest, but that uh, you should rest at least one day Within a week, you not only you, but all those who were in your household. Now, this another verse here that uh, I've had difficulty at first, how to approach it, the subject, um, and how to handle it. Uh, I've heard more than one sermon about uh, this commandment, the Sabbath, and some Christians saying, well, we no longer need to keep the Sabbath. It's uh, Old Testament stuff. It's the law, and we're not in that anymore. Um, and on the other hand, no, to another extreme where we keep the Sabbath to a T. We don't do anything else. We're pretty much just like the Jews. We're strict observance, and uh, uh, there is no 
finagling with how to approach it. But we were uh, straight and narrow, keep the Sabbath, and uh, don't do <laughs> slang term diddly squat. <laughs> uh, but uh, so while not being uh, another one to add to the confusion, um, the question comes up, is this valid today? And uh, I asked myself that, and I, but then really it's not my wisdom that I should be leaning on, it's looking in the scriptures, as well as being as led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, one that makes me, piques my interest is when Paul was speaking on the creation account, and there it states that, uh, you know, that on the seventh day, God rested from all his work, and that it is holy. Uh, so I, I, I wonder to myself, well, why is that stated even within the creation account? And even before God brings his commandments here to the nation of Israel, number five, before. Uh, so that, that's one thing. And uh, I've also heard it say that, uh, well, if we're no longer to keep this commandment today, in the new covenant, in the sense, well, how's come it's just this one and not, well, we live in the new covenant, therefore I can steal still. Or, you know, or I can murder. Uh, why am I picking out just one of these Ten Commandments and not, uh, uh, you know, being that specific to, and, 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 and not following the rest of them? Or, following the rest of them and not this one. Uh, you might have your own thoughts about this. I know this is a, can be a, a, a tricky subject, uh, tricky in the sense of um, um, don't want to be legalistic about it, and yet I feel in my heart of hearts and, and what God has led me to this point that uh, our bodies are meant to have rest. Uh, physically working, pounding it out seven days a week, no whatsoever time to, to uh, especially the main reason, to devote to sole purpose of, of seeking God in uh, prayer and study, uh, but also in fellowship and and uh, with one another, um, that uh, it is for our benefit, uh, it is for our good, uh, and I don't, I don't uh, deem it to be legalistic if I say in my own household that uh, um, you know today is the day that we are going to set aside to to devote to not doing all the things that need to be done all the other six days a week, but I'm going to focus more on rest as much as possible. Jesus speaks about this in the New Testament. We would like to look more in that later. Uh, that, uh, As he says, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, that, and you remember the story of him healing a man on the, on the Sabbath and then the Pharisees and religious leaders were getting mad at him. And then he says, well, what's better to do, good on the Sabbath or evil? Uh, and of course, the, question, the, the answer is good, of course. It's not that you don't do zero work, but that we, what we do on the Sabbath is necessary. Uh, I still milked the cows this morning. <laughs> uh, I still fed the chickens and uh, so on and so forth, and we still cook our own food and that kind of thing. But uh, maybe I'll go on a little bit too, too much on this, but this is another one that we could dive more into a separate standalone Sunday sermon. But moving on to verse, chapter, uh, verse 16, It'll be number five. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you. 
that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which your Lord, your God, is giving you. Honoring our parents. Uh, that is uh, with a heavy heart thing that's, I think, missing in our culture very much today. Uh, parenthood is, is a blessing and those who have raised us should be honored um, even if they might not be the best parents uh, we still should not they still should not lack the the honor that is due them and I know in the the promise that he gives here I know that when we hear others speak about this that you're that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Uh, I believe the society is, is definitely healthy and longer lasting when the older generation is, is held in honor and uh, taken care of. We're on verse uh, number 6, which is verse 17. You shall not murder. Now, some translations just say kill. Uh, but I looked into that a little bit more and it states that the the uh, original Hebrew uh, would lead one to translate better murder. And what is murder compared to kill? Uh, uh, taking someone's life with evil intent to take their life. Uh, as, we, as you read elsewhere in the, the, the books of the law that... Uh, that uh, there are several times and there are stipulations about, well, if this person accidentally kills us, another person, that person is not held guilty, uh, so on and so forth in that sense. Um, but that is murder is the evil intent of going into someone else and actually wanting to take their life. Uh, it's written elsewhere that uh, about this subject, about killing, that uh, murdering, that uh, each one of us, remember back in Genesis 1 in the creation, were made in the image of God. And that is why we're not the same as the animal kingdom. Uh, we are, uh, in his eyes, more precious than many sparrows. So, moving on to number... Yeah. Verse 18... You shall not commit adultery. Adultery being, you know, cheating on your spouse with a, another person who is not your spouse. Uh, marriage bed is undefiled, as it says in the New Testament. Now, Jesus has something uh, to say about this even further as I get on here a little bit later. Verse 19, you shall not steal. Um, and if you've ever stolen, you do not, you're not a stealer. <laughs> you are a thief. Uh, it is something that uh, uh, is not respected of value of the thing that you take. Uh, many of us might think, well, I've got that one pretty much covered. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't stolen someone's car. Uh, I haven't, uh, uh, so on and so forth, as in not been on the news or local newspaper saying that I've been convicted of burglary, so on and, and that kind of thing. But yet, uh, it's when I take something of someone else's without their permission, it is theft. Uh, it is uh, stealing. Verse 20, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, some translations, I was looking through all the English, and shall not lie, uh, or might uh, add, say it slightly differently than bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, but the, the intention is to, to not tell the truth about whatever subject not to be completely honest. Now here comes up the subject of the day that uh, I'm thinking of as someone, well, well, if you told a lie, and well, you know, a little white lies. I don't know what makes them white. If somebody knows, I don't know. 
why aren't they red or blue or <laughs> uh, but but the uh, you know lying to to uh, most of the time keep us from getting in trouble when we know we're in trouble or uh, uh, um, yes uh, excusing our guilt for something it leads to verse 21 you shall not covet your neighbor's wife you shall not desire your neighbor's house his field his male servant his female servant his ox his donkey or anything that is in that is your neighbor's coveting now, there is another one that is very prevalent in our society because we are blessed with much material things um Every time we turn on the news or, or seeing something of, of stories of, of the wealthy and then hearing those who are not so wealthy saying, well, I wish I had that. I wish I could get that. Or why can't I be that rich? So on. And uh, that uh, coveting can lead to the breaking of these other commandments. That's why he says, uh, not your neighbor's wife, his field, his male servant, his, his donkey. Uh, so that we would uh, want, desire something so much of someone else's that we would go to the extent of murdering, adultery, lying, stealing it, so on. But that, that is, uh, it is our neighbor's and not ours. God gives us what we need. We don't need to take things in our hand, think that well, I need it more than they do. But verse 22, these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added, no more. That piques my interest as well when he says, and he added, no more. Just Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Always, right now, I'm picturing my mind. Of course, the, back to the movie with Moses holding the two stone tablets. Uh, and yet, were written, as it says, by the finger of God. Uh, and the Ark of the Covenant, which would be in the temple, these two stone tablets were put in it as well, uh, as well as some other things. But uh, I think that that is significant. Back to the question of these two, these Ten Commandments, while there's other laws in these first five books of the Bible, but these Ten Commandments are, uh, let's say, not for that time period only. But that uh, they are the the uh, let's say the the measuring stick, the 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 uh, gauge of uh, God's holiness, and that is timeless. And that uh, if you read to the book of uh, Romans, that even those who have not looked at these Ten Commandments in foreign countries uh, never read the Bible, and yet you find them in these commandments and what they talk about written, as the Bible says, written on their hearts and their consciences bearing witness that, that God, even when he created us, um, in the, the knowledge of good and evil, uh, after uh, Adam and Eve ate from the fruit in the garden, that uh, we know that uh, if I never taught my children these Ten Commandments, we, they would know that uh, when they go to their brother and take their stuff without their permission, uh, I don't think I, 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 that they are without guilt. Um, that, uh, that these laws are written on our hearts and our consciences. Now, this all asks, the question comes up today, and do they still apply? 
and why I think of that we neglect to understand the rest of Christianity here in the New Covenant after Jesus' death and resurrection in the time of grace and what was before then uh, in the Old Covenant through the law. Um, it's it's to, to our a detriment is, is what I want to say that uh, we would understand more if we understood the old. Uh, so it's not something that we should brush under the rug uh, or not uh, um, ever sermonize or, or, or lessons about, but that uh, we can still teach these and have these hung up in our, our own homes, uh, if not in front of the course at courthouses, uh, that uh, they are um, very much needed and have their purpose. Which leads me to, if you want to follow along with me, to the gospel according to Matthew. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks about this um, point that I'm making when he repeat, uh, replies in verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill Meaning he held the law that we just went through to a T, to the exact, where he was without sin. As a fully human and fully God. For I assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, how they wrote in the scrolls in Hebrew, uh, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That is pretty explanatory to me that uh, just because Jesus came doesn't mean the law is no longer in effect. It is uh, still very much like ten cannons pointing at us that if we should break these, we are deserving of death. That is the curse of the law uh, spoken of in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul speaks on, that uh, the law is meant to, uh, if it could, perfection. That we would, these Ten Commandments are summed up. Uh, as we say, God's more, uh, more so the first four commandments and then the, the rest of them uh, to our, our neighbors. But that uh, we are in grace, under grace, and not under law. Now, what does that mean? Um, I'm going to turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 19 and 20. If the law is not for us now... What's his purpose? The Apostle Paul goes on to say, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, the works, no flesh, no human being, will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Uh, elsewhere he says, uh, the book of Romans uh, is a good book to read more about law and grace. If you would like to do that on your own time. Um, that the, I would not have known what it is to lie, cheat, steal, uh, commit adultery and such, if the law had not said, don't do that. Um, and yet, like I said before, that God has even put it on our conscience, uh, made since we are made in His image, that uh, that we are not still without guilt. Um, but that the 
law is a knowledge of sin. To know that we are not going to justify ourselves on Judgment Day. And we have these Ten Commandments pointing at us, Ten Commandments. So this is the standard by which you are to live, that we have, that I, that God have fellowship with us, his creation. For God is holy and cannot dwell with sin. Um, but moving on to the subject, to, to uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3. It says it another way. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 23 to 25. But before faith came, the New Testament, New Covenant, we were kept under guard by the law. And there's another good reason why there's still, uh, it makes you wonder why would we not want to have the law, these Ten Commandments in front of the law house to keep under guard those who wish to break it um, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed therefore the law was our tutor or schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith but after faith has come we are no longer under a tutor you get a picture of us say, B.C., before Christ, my life, the law is always there saying, don't do that, don't do that. You can't do that, that's not good, so on and so forth. Uh, and yet, uh, back to Paul in the, the book of Romans in chapter 7, you know, in our sinful flesh, I see the law and it's good and holy, and yet my own sinful nature says, well, you know, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the, the sinful flesh just says, my way, not God's way. Uh, but yet this, this commandment, the Ten Commandments is still there pointing us to, you're not up to this standard. You can't do this standard. It's not meant to make us to become like that standard. It is only to show us that we are uh, fallen, that we are uh, in need of a savior. Uh, this schoolmaster, sorry, a picture of this uh, older lady with a long yardstick saying, stop looking at me and look at him. <laughs> uh, him being Christ. Uh, that uh, you can't save yourself by trying to keep the law. It is always going to be a failure one way or another. Uh, and it's not meant to save us. It is meant to lead us to faith in Christ. Faith as in I'm no longer trusting in myself and my own abilities, the things that God has given me, uh, or the things that uh, I have accumulated. Um, back to idols and such, but that uh, Christ alone who came to save mankind from their sins, that he alone is able to save us. Uh, not only in justification, meaning that we're uh, completely right with God and our sins have been wiped away, but yet as we live day and day, uh, my favorite uh, chapter uh, chapter 8 of Romans, that there is now no condemnation those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk daily by the flesh, but by the Spirit. That uh, after Christ ascended, and he told the, the, the apostles to wait in Jerusalem for power from on high to come. Pentecost. Uh, and that now today, when we come to Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And he says he wrote his laws on our hearts and our minds, that we would 
want to obey him, that we would desire to obey him and seek him and to do his will. So it is, there is hope yet, but yet, as long as we, as long as we're in the position that we still try to justify ourselves and say, at least ten commandments, I'm not that bad, or I'm kind of fudging on a little bit of, well, I really didn't tell a lie. It was a white lie. Or, you know, that person deserved what they deserved if I hurt them, uh, so on and so forth. But, uh, but that, uh, in truth, that we walk in the Spirit and are led by the Spirit, Christ is with us to, to uh, power to overcome our, our sinful nature. This is where uh, I believe uh, prayer is uh, much neglected in the church in America. Uh, leaning on the Spirit and following Him. Uh, for the more we are led by the Spirit, the more we don't have to worry about well, did I break God's commands today? Or did I, am I not living up to his standards? Um, but always falling upon Christ and resting upon his strength and power. For he, he has not left us as orphans, but he has left us with the, the, uh, the ability to overcome the sin in our lives, the flesh, the devil, and the world around us that we live in. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this day once again. And Lord, thank you for your commandments. As you're written in your Psalms that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And many times throughout the Psalms, it's a, how much I love your law, O Lord, that I see it in a, in a right light. That I don't hate it anymore, Lord, but uh, I know that you have given it to us for our good. And uh, Lord, if, uh, if there are any here today or online, that uh, Lord, by your spirit, have, have, uh, by your commands, that, uh, that the sin is stacked against them. And Lord, that uh, they feel the guilt and the, the weight of it, and that uh, they would have godly sorrow to repent, turn away from those, turn away from trust in self, and turn to you and your amazing grace and your tender mercies. Lord, for you are loving and kind and gracious and compassionate. We ask for your help to understand your commands, uh, even when they might be difficult at first, Lord, help us to grow in the knowledge of, of uh, what it means to follow you and uh, in your word. We ask these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we go to our last hymn. If you would uh, please stand. 670, make me a blessing.
Thanks again for coming, and uh, uh, maybe I'll see you next week uh, as I was uh, asked to speak at Freeburg, Uh, but uh, maybe we'll come back for the uh, Pastor Appreciation Lunch, and so hope to see you then. Um, But thank you again for coming this morning. I got the call from Sarah that the electric wasn't on and wondering if we were going to have service at all, and uh, part of me says, well, well, I'm getting out of preaching. (laughs) But another part of me says, oh, I'm getting out of preaching. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm glad that the Lord can work things out. And, uh, and uh, it's a bright and beautiful day outside, so to enjoy it. God bless you all.